This happened when I was a child, but it's always stuck with me. My parents had just bought a new house. This was right after the prices went way up in the early 2000s. The house we were moving into was a total dump because it's all we could afford. Before we bought it, it was a crack house. Most of the windows were broken. The fence had been knocked down by the police when they raided it, and we found used needles in the garbage disposal. Mom and Dad had to fix it up a lot before we could move in. Dad would go over after work to do repairs and paint. He came home one night and said, When I got to the house today, I saw a little kid. He said he saw a boy walking down the hallway into the master bedroom, but when he went in there, the room was empty. At first he thought we had been there and left one of our friends behind, but when he realized that we weren't there, he didn't know what to make of the situation, and it kind of scared him. Mom just said that the fumes from the paint were making him imagine things, and that he should open a window and use a mask from now on. Keep in mind, though, my dad is not the type of person to believe in any kind of ghost or paranormal thing, and he didn't really scare easily, so this was kind of out of character for him. Right after we moved in, my little sister began talking to an imaginary friend, a little boy named Mikey. This was unusual for her because she was not the kind to play pretend. She didn't even like playing with dolls. She was more of a computer geek, so it was a little odd for her to have an imaginary friend. Normally, when a child invents an imaginary friend, it's because they want someone to play with. But her imaginary friend was super annoying. He was constantly bothering her. She was always complaining that Mikey wouldn't share a toy or that he wouldn't play the game she wanted or that he wasn't following the rules and taking turns. Who invents an imaginary friend that fights with them all day long? One day my mom was out front talking to the neighbor lady. She told mom that before the place was a crack house, there was a family living there that had kids. And she asked if we ever saw anything weird in the house. According to her, the family that lived there before us saw a little boy named Mikey in the house. This neighbor claimed her own son, who was now a teenager, used to play with Mikey too when he was younger and would visit the neighbors. She even said she saw Mikey herself on several occasions. That kind of freaked Mom out. My sister and I used to spend the weekends with our grandparents. While we were gone, Mom had to take the batteries out of all the toys because they would go off randomly when no one was in the room. For example, I had a piggy bank that made an oinky noise any time you put money in it. One night, it simply would not stop oinking, so Mom and Dad checked it out to see if it was jammed, but nothing was in it. I ended up having to throw it away because it just would not stop going off in the middle of the night, even when I was at home. Another thing, I never had sleeping problems before we moved into that house, nor did I have them after we left. But while we lived there, every morning I would wake up with my body contorted and shoved into the little space between the bed and the dresser, curled up in a tight little ball. I'd be so jammed in there that Mom had to pull me out every morning. We tried to figure out how it was happening, but we never could. And this never happened when I stayed at my grandparents' house. I was in the third or fourth grade at the time, and they had to put guardrails on my bed so I wouldn't fall out. But it didn't help. Every morning, I'd still be jammed in between the dresser and the bed. One night my mom was in the kitchen, and she had the feeling that somebody was watching her. When she turned around, she caught a glimpse of a little boy standing there. She said he looked about eight years old. He appeared for a second, and then he was gone. A few days after that, it was my sister's birthday. After the party, my sister and I spent the night at her grandparents' house. Mom and Dad were home alone. Mom took the helium-filled balloons from the party and tied them together and put them in the corner of the living room. Later that night, they were watching TV when suddenly the balloon strings gathered together like someone had grabbed them, and they were jerked down about a foot. Then they floated very slowly around the corner and down the back hallway. Once they got to the ceiling light in the hallway, the balloons dipped down and around the light, 
and continued down the hall to my sister's bedroom door. My parents were watching in shock, not knowing what to do. But then my mom said out loud, Mikey, if you want the balloons, you can have them. As soon as she said that, the balloons disappeared into my sister's bedroom. After that, my mom looked into the history of the property. She found out that ours and three other houses on that block were built on property that used to belong to an old Catholic orphanage. One day, my sister said, It's Mikey's birthday. He wants us to make a cake for him. So my mom made a cake for him. She also made a note on what day it was that my sister claimed was Mikey's birthday to see if my sister would remember it the following year or if it was just something she made up. But sure enough, the entire time that we lived in that house, my sister would ask for a birthday cake for Mikey on the same day every year. One Christmas, Mom went out and bought Mikey a little toy horse. A couple of days later, the horse disappeared. My sister and I hadn't touched it and had no idea where it went. Two years later, we were playing outside, and we found the horse buried in the backyard. We took it inside, cleaned it off, and put it on the coffee table. That night, it went missing again, and we haven't seen it since. Three months ago, I was camping with a friend in a remote part of Northern California. I'm a massive wilderness junkie, and I spend much of my free time hiking, rock climbing, fishing, and doing every sort of outdoor activity. My friend was heading up to the Sierras for the weekend, and he asked me to come along. We didn't stay at a campsite, but hiked about 10 miles from our car to a clearing with a beautiful view. He'd been there before. On our second night there, we were sitting by the fire around 10 p.m. My friend got tired and went to the tent to go to sleep, but I wanted to stay up for a while. About 45 minutes after he went to bed, I saw something coming up from the valley below. It looked just like a UFO from a movie. It was saucer-shaped and had circular lights rotating all around the edges, and they were changing colors over and over again. I was absolutely shocked. I stared at it for maybe 15 seconds. Then I tried to wake up my friend so he could see it too and prove to myself that I wasn't going crazy. I stood up and called out his name and that's when everything started to get really messed up. I couldn't hear my own voice when I called out. Everything was completely silent. I could move my eyes, but I couldn't move my body. I remember looking at the fire, and it seemed frozen in place, like a snapshot. It was like time itself had stopped. Then there was a bright flash of light, and I blacked out. The next thing I remember, I woke up as the sun was rising. I was outside lying in the dirt, shivering next to a fire that had long died out. I felt like I'd been drugged. I was groggy and yelled out my friend's name a couple of times until he came out of the tent. He was really confused, to say the least, as I tried to explain what happened. But my memory was really foggy, and I couldn't articulate my thoughts well. But we were both freaked out enough that we packed up and left within 30 minutes. I was totally silent on the car ride home, falling in and out of a restless sleep for the entire seven-hour drive. My friend dropped me off at my house, and I basically passed out for the entire day. I tried to put the incident out of my mind. But a few weeks later, I was messing around with my stereo amp. It made a staticky noise when I unplugged my guitar. And for some reason, that sound triggered my memory, and everything that happened that night up in the Sierras came flooding back to me. That night I blacked out at around 10.45 p.m., standing by the fire. When I became conscious again, I was suspended inside a vertical circle in a strange room. My body was posed much like da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. There were shackles holding me in place, and they looked like they were made of clear glass. I was completely naked. 
Standing in front of me were three beings that looked like aliens. They were about four feet tall and wearing white spandex like suits. Two of them were just standing there observing, and the third was extracting blood from a vein under my armpit using a weird looking syringe type thing. Although they didn't show any emotion, I could tell they were really surprised that I was awake. I couldn't move at all except for my eyes and lips. It was absolutely terrifying. My heart was pounding from an influx of adrenaline. I can't even begin to tell you how scared I was. But I also felt total rage. I wanted to kill them, to completely destroy them. My brain went primal, running on animal instinct alone. I could tell they sensed my anger because they all took a few steps back simultaneously. I'm six foot three and 185 pounds, and I was trying to look as threatening as possible, which was pretty silly because I was totally paralyzed and therefore completely harmless. At that point, two of them disappeared from my view and presumably left the room. The other one was just staring at me, devoid of any emotion at all. I wanted so badly to shut my eyes, but I forced myself to stare back at him, trying hard not to blink. Then the other two came back, but this time they weren't alone. I couldn't believe my eyes. Standing behind them were two very tall, very human-looking beings, a male and a female. They looked like Norse gods, with bright golden hair and massive eyes. The male's eyes were dark blue, and the females were violet. I suppose they're what the UFO community refers to as the Nordics. It was so bizarre. My family comes from Sweden, and I'm very Nordic-looking. Blonde hair, blue eyes, light skin, the works. I know this is cliché, but I heard the female's voice in my mind. Somehow I could understand what she was saying, even though she wasn't using anything even close to English. She told me something like, Be calm. You're not in any danger. So I relaxed and asked her what they wanted with me. She said they were just checking up on me. I almost blacked out after hearing that. I asked her what she meant, and she said that they had saved my life when I first came into being. I immediately knew what she was talking about. I was born two months premature. My mother was horribly sick during the labor, and we both had fevers of 104 degrees. The strange thing is, though, the doctors had absolutely no idea what was wrong with us. I was given two spinal taps and my mother was given three. I spent four nights in the neonatal ICU, and there was a decent chance that I was going to die. But then one day, I just started getting better out of nowhere, and I made a full recovery. The doctors were very worried that the whole ordeal may have permanently damaged my body or my brain. But I was totally fine. I asked her, Why did you save me? But this time she didn't answer, the male did. I heard a deep voice say, This is a conversation for another time. I asked if they were human. He said no. I was confused because they looked so human. I asked if mankind was descended from them. He said yes, that they had come here 200,000 years ago and created mankind by combining their DNA with our primate ancestors. He also said that through the years, many males of his kind found female humans attractive and mated with them. So this directly passed on some of their physical features and traits to the Nordic people. I wanted to know more, but they declined to answer any further questions, and he said it was time for me to go back. When he said that, I blacked out instantly, and I woke up next to the extinguished campfire, once again wearing my clothes and shivering. I know this entire thing sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it happened. I don't know what to do. I've been completely lost and scared ever since the encounter. But I already feel a little bit better telling my story here.
In 2016, my best friend and I were roommates in our first year of college. By the end of that year, we had come to the conclusion that our dorm room was haunted. It always felt like somebody was standing in the doorway watching us. Being alone in the room was the most terrifying because you never felt truly alone. We both saw a dark figure standing there from time to time too, just observing us. We also had very noisy upstairs neighbors. There would be constant thumping, footsteps, and knocking at all hours of the day and night. On many occasions, we went upstairs to complain to the guys who lived above us, but they were adamant that they hadn't been making any noise at all, going so far as to write us a note stating that they were sorry that we were being disturbed, but that they were in no way responsible for causing this nightly noise. One evening, when the banging and footsteps were particularly loud, we decided to go down a few floors to the cafeteria just to get away from the noise. When we arrived, we discovered the two guys living above us down there eating a late dinner. So it wasn't them making the noise. We felt really bad for having accused them all this time, but they were so nice about it. They even showed us their class schedules to prove that a lot of the times that we heard the noise they weren't even home. But by far, the scariest thing that happened to me that year was the horrifying nightmare that I had. In the dream, I was someone else, a man. I was standing in the doorway to our room, quietly observing, before I dropped down to my stomach and crawled across the room using my elbows, military style. I crawled over to my roommate's bedside and stood over her, with this intense urge to kill her. In the dream, she sat up and screamed loudly, and it was so realistic that I woke up in a cold sweat. I remember lurching upright in bed and staring hard at my friend, who was still asleep, just to make sure she hadn't actually been screaming in terror. I couldn't sleep for two or three nights after that. I was so upset by the nightmare, I was afraid if I went to sleep, it would come again. I'm still traumatized by that dream today, remembering every single detail all these years later. Not long after that, we discovered that next door to our dormitory, literally next door, was the Chi Omega sorority house, the place where Ted Bundy brutally attacked four sorority girls, killing two of them back in 1978. Now, I'm not saying that Ted Bundy was haunting us, because that's a real stretch. But my friend and I do have a theory that the land is vulnerable to being a sort of portal for bad energy and spirits because of what happened there. When I was a child, I had a best friend named Anna, and her mother's name was Lana. Lana terrified me for some reason. She had such an ominous presence about her that it gave me nightmares. Anna and I were friends between the ages of 4 and 12. Around age 8, I was sleeping over at Anna's, and her mother brought a Ouija board out and said she was going to play with us. Being so young, we had no clue what a Ouija board even was, much less the danger it could bring. But that didn't faze her one bit. Lana decided to wait until it was completely dark outside before we'd play. When she deemed it was time, she got all dressed up in a long black cloak, lit some candles, and walked Anna, Anna's brother Greg, and me out to the woods behind the house at 11 p.m. at night. You know, just what any responsible adult would do with small children in her care. Their home was completely surrounded by woods on all sides, and I was terrified at that point because I was already afraid of the dark and being in the forest at night was an added bonus to freak me out. We sat in a circle on the grass in the woods and Lana put frankincense and myrrh behind her ears. Where she got hold of those I'll never know. I was holding a rosary tightly in my hand. That detail sticks out in my mind. We began to play I can't remember any of the questions that were asked, but that planchette absolutely did move around the board. 
Anna's brother Greg was sitting next to me. I remember both of our hands being on the planchette, and he looked up at me with absolute terror on his face, stunned that the planchette was actually moving. To this day, that experience still negatively impacts me. The nightmares I had about Lana have really stuck with me, and I've been haunted by them for so long. This happened 17 years ago, and I still feel uneasy as I type this. My friends and I are into urban exploration, and we went to check out an abandoned insane asylum one night, not really expecting anything to happen. We broke in through one of the boarded-up windows. Once we were inside, we heard the sound of voices speaking very softly. We figured some other explorers had broken in too, so we followed the sounds of the voices to see who it was. As we were walking down the main hallway, we heard what sounded like a woman whispering, Why did you take my baby? Why did you take my baby? Over and over again. At that point, I was so scared, I was shaking. The voices sounded like they were coming from a room to the left. But as we entered that room, we saw a huge cage. It looked like one of those pet carriers, but it was human size, and nobody was in the room. In fact, we looked all over that first floor, and nobody was there. I don't know what the hell was going on that night, and I don't really believe dead people were talking to us. But the sheer creepiness of it all was too much for me. I will not be going back. For a while when I was young, my mother, sister, and I lived in a shelter for battered women and children. Due to a very ugly divorce and a messed up legal system in Alabama, my abusive father was given full custody of me and my sister. So in an effort to protect us, mom technically kidnapped us kids and went on the run, with my father in hot pursuit. We fled from Alabama to Washington State. One night in the shelter, I looked in the mirror and I saw a demon looking back at me. I screamed and ran to get my mom, but she assured me that there was nothing wrong. It was just my imagination. But that night, a kind-looking man that I can only describe as an angel appeared at the end of my bed. He was surrounded by a soft white light and stood there silently watching over me all night. But when I woke up in the morning, he was gone but he appeared again the next night, and then the next and the next, silently watching over me, keeping me safe. He was there every night for the entire four months that we stayed in that shelter. He never spoke, he never moved, just stood guard. I told my mom about the angel man, and this time she believed me. Then one night he woke me up out of a deep sleep. I'll never forget how surprised I was because he had never spoken before. He was calm and authoritative, but spoke with urgency. He said, He's coming. You have to get out now. I woke up Mom and told her what the angel man had said. I guess she thought it was better safe than sorry, because we packed up the car and went to a cheap motel for the night. The next day when we went back, we discovered that Dad had broken in that night and gone from room to room looking for us. But he left before the police came. We moved from that shelter not long after, and I never saw the angel man again. Mom never took us back to Alabama. We stayed in Washington, and she eventually won full custody of us both and a lifetime restraining order against my dad. Although, in Alabama, she's still wanted for kidnapping. But be that as it may, Thanks to Mom and our guardian angel, we're all still alive and safe.
One day, I was running on the wooded trails of the Nathan Hale Homestead. It's an 18th century farmhouse, the property of a Revolutionary War hero in Connecticut. I was only going to run for 45 minutes, using my watch to keep time. I ran for a while, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. It was about 9 a.m. on a Monday morning. I was completely alone, with only the sounds of distant traffic from Route 31, the chirping birds, and the occasional deer that would scamper away whenever I came near, to keep me company. About 20 minutes in, I saw something strange 50 meters ahead of me. A finely polished wooden coffin. I was a little weirded out, to say the least. I went in closer for a better look, but while running towards it, I had to round a corner with some old tree stumps blocking my view. When I got out from around them, the coffin had disappeared. Where I had just seen it moments before was now only a bunch of bushes. At that point, I decided to turn around and make my way back to the car. I was maybe half a mile away when I heard a very distinctive knocking on a nearby tree. It was to the rhythm of that old shaving a haircut two bits song. You know, da 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 da. Only it didn't have the two bits ending. It sounded like this. Not ten seconds later, there it was again, but this time on a completely different tree, up ahead of me somewhere. I picked up the pace, wanting to get back to the relative safety of my car as soon as possible. I was close enough now to see the entrance of the parking lot up ahead, but just as I saw it, once again, on a tree seemingly right next to me this time, I heard... I truly started to freak out now. I ran faster than I ever have to get back to my car. It was at that point when time seemed to slow down. All of a sudden, the temperature dropped about 20 degrees, the bird stopped singing, and my watch malfunctioned. It was making all kinds of beepy noises, and the numbers on the display panel were glitching out on the screen. Right then, I heard it again. But this time, it was impossibly loud. It sounded like it was coming from every tree in the surrounding area. An overwhelming sense of dread washed over me as I anticipated hearing the two bits part of the refrain, or perhaps worse than hearing it, seeing what was causing it. As I ran into the parking lot, I looked down at my watch. It was flashing 12 p.m. noon, January 1st. My watch had reset itself. It had never done that before. I grabbed my keys, got into the car, and started the engine. As soon as the engine turned on, the clock on the car radio said 12 noon. That couldn't be right. It should have only been 9.45 a.m. at the latest. I threw the car in reverse and backed out of the parking spot. But just as I was about to throw the car into drive and pull away, that's when I heard it. The final part of the couplet that was missing throughout the ordeal. There was a sharp rap at the back window, like someone hit it with their knuckles. the two bits part of the refrain. There was no one else in the parking lot. No cars, no people, no animals, no anything. I was completely alone. So what was rapping on the window? Well, I didn't look behind me. I just hightailed it out of there and back to my house. I have no idea what could have caused that series of events. And I still can't explain it to this day. I used to be in the military, and the training camp barracks where we lived was haunted. 
it started out innocently. Our stuff would disappear, then reappear in weird places, like the shower or inside a bag that we had zipped up and put away. At first we figured it was no big deal. It could have been human error or maybe someone playing a prank. But what came next freaked everyone out. One night after lights out, when we were supposed to put everything away and go to sleep, my friend was on his phone texting his girlfriend. Suddenly, he heard footsteps coming from the hallway. Thinking it was our sergeant, he quickly hid the phone under his pillow, rolled over, and pretended to be asleep. He heard someone come up behind him, and then a soft voice say, Go ahead. Pretend you're asleep. I don't mind. There was no one there. Now normally I would dismiss this as a figment of his imagination, if not for the fact that five other people around him heard it as well, including me. Creepier still, it was the voice of a little girl that said it. Now our training camp is in the middle of an island and it's been closed to everyone but military personnel for the past 15 years, so there were no civilians around, let alone children. To make things even freakier, when we came back from our weekend leave, there was a bunch of long black female hair on his bed, neatly bundled up, and underneath his pillow was a note that said, Remember me? And it was in a child's handwriting. When I was a rookie cop, my brother committed suicide. My brother and I were very close, and I had a lot of guilt for not recognizing the signs and getting him the help that he needed. By the time his body was discovered, he'd begun to decompose, so we had a closed coffin service. About a week after he died, I was on the job one night. My partner and I saw a pimp beating and pistol whipping one of his girls. I jumped out of the car, and the pimp saw me and took off running. I ran after him, gun in hand. He cut through an alleyway at the back of a building that led to a courtyard. Right before I reached the courtyard, I heard my dead brother's voice in my head say, It's okay. You're safe. As I hit the courtyard, the guy came out from behind a wall, pointed his gun at my head, and pulled the trigger. Twice. I froze for a second, realized I was still alive, and started beating him in the head with my revolver. To this day, I don't know why I didn't pull the trigger, but I'm very glad I didn't. After he was subdued, I cuffed him and walked him back to the car. I told my partner about him squeezing off two rounds and the gun not going off, but not about the voice I heard. We unloaded his gun, a thirty-two revolver, right there. We found that two of the bullets in the chamber had strike marks on them. That's not supposed to happen. After returning to the station, we had the gun tested right away, because if the gun were inoperable, for say, a defective firing pin or bad ammunition, they wouldn't charge him with attempted murder, just menacing in the second degree. I told the lab guy the story of what happened. He examined the two bullets, saw the strike marks on them, put them back in the gun, then shot them into a water tank to see if they would fire. Both bullets fired. The pimp took a plea deal for attempted manslaughter and criminal possession of a weapon. He got 12 years. I told my family the story, but I told my mother first. She was so devastated over losing her son, I wanted to share the story with her and maybe make her feel better. I said... Maybe my brother knows what he did was so painful for everyone to bear that by saving me, he was trying to atone for it. And also to let us know that he's not really gone, but he's here looking out for us. She did feel better, at least that day. I used to be a police officer in the UK. 
As a brand new recruit at the age of 19, I hadn't been on the job very long. When one day I was patrolling on foot, walking past a group of shops just getting to know the area. It was a quiet evening in September with just a few people around. My intention was to keep walking down the street, but for some reason I turned around and went back to the shops. And just as I did, there was a radio call to one of the cars to attend an incident in that same location where I was. I radioed in to say that I was already on the scene, so was given permission to go ahead and see what was happening. It turned out that an older man had collapsed in the car park after leaving a restaurant. The staff had called an ambulance and the police. The man's wife had been waiting in the car for him, so she was on the scene too. I got to him within seconds, and it was evident that the man needed an ambulance urgently. He was unconscious, and he had saliva spewing from his mouth in a constant stream, and his poor wife was trying to mop it up with tissues. His wife was nearly hysterical. I still don't know what caused it, presumably a stroke. The ambulance was very quick to respond. As the paramedics strapped him into the stretcher and loaded him onto the ambulance, I was standing at the back door, waiting to help his wife climb inside so she could ride along. No one but me saw what happened next. I saw that man sit up. He sat up straight, and he didn't have any straps on him any longer. He looked at his wife standing next to me and raised his hand to wave at her, but she didn't notice or acknowledge the wave at all. All of this happened in a matter of seconds. I blinked, looked back, and he was lying down on the stretcher again, unconscious and strapped in. He hadn't moved, but I'd just seen him sit up. One of the paramedics looked at me and shook his head, indicating that the man had died. His wife was not aware of that at the time. I helped her into the back of the ambulance and then made out my report, but I obviously left out the part about the vision I had of his waving goodbye to his wife. I never told anyone what I saw. During my sophomore year at college, my mother and sister Fern decided to rent a small cottage off campus to be near me. It came fully furnished, because the lady who had lived there before them had just walked out one day, breaking the lease and leaving all of her belongings behind. My sister and I were hanging out one day, and she mentioned that she and Mom were having some crazy dreams, and that the mattresses in the cottage all had reddish-brown stains on them so they threw them in a room in the basement and bought new ones. She showed me a picture of the mattresses. Uh, Fern? That looks like blood on the mattresses. A lot of blood. What is that? She said, Well, it really doesn't matter. We have new ones now. Anyway, they invited me to stay in the guest room for a few days at the end of term, since we'd all be driving back to New York together after school ended. The house was a little unsettling, but fine, until I asked to do some laundry. I asked my sister where the washing machine was. She said, Oh, uh, it's in the basement. I'll show you. She opened the basement door, and her dog started growling. She told the dog to be quiet and told me to follow her down the stairs. The moment my foot touched those stairs, I felt nauseous. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and my hands went clammy. There was this feeling that something menacing was looming down there. The basement was completely unfinished. It was just concrete floors and old pipes. Fern pointed to a rusty metal door off to the right. That's where we put the bloody mattresses. There's a pool table in there, too. Want to see? For some reason, Fern didn't seem to feel the same things I was feeling. She went over and casually opened up the door. I could see inside from three feet away, and there was no way in hell I was getting any closer. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I recognized the pile of bloody, dirty mattresses stacked up in front of an old pool table. Fern told me that there were two more doors in that room, 
but they were locked and they weren't given a key by the landlord, so she has no idea what's behind them. I was literally shaking at that point, and the dog was still upstairs, whining and growling. Trying to hide my nerves, I told Vern to just close the door and show me where the laundry room was. She closed the door and pointed me to a different door, opened it up, and pulled the string to turn on the single, bare light bulb that was hanging from the ceiling. Inside was an old washer and dryer, with a long metal table between them. Upon closer inspection, there was a rusty red smear that went from the top of the washer all the way down to the end of the table. The rest of the room was filled with junk, cardboard boxes, sheet metal, and broken furniture. The single bulb did not even come close to illuminating the entire room, so it was like standing in a spotlight. The feeling of being watched was nearly unbearable, like a low, heavy ache in my chest. But my sister seemed totally oblivious to everything. I said something about needing to go upstairs and get my dirty clothes, but Fern said, Oh, it's okay. Wait here. I'll get them for you. And then she ran off. Not wanting to be down there alone, I tried to follow her. But before I could, I felt a hand grab my shoulder from behind. I spun around, ready to punch the crap out of whatever had just touched me. But there was nothing there. That's when I heard a low, sarcastic voice say, Welcome. Three inches from my face. I just about wet myself. I flew out of that room and up the stairs, screaming bloody murder. When I got to the living room, my sister and mom asked me what was wrong. Embarrassed and not wanting to tell them that I thought I heard a ghost, I told them I saw a millipede. Neither one of them seemed to feel anything out of the ordinary in the house, and I didn't want them to think I was crazy. I didn't do laundry that night or any night until we got back to New York. I don't regret it either. Having dirty clothes was a small price to pay to avoid whatever was in that basement. While staying at the Royal Hotel in New Orleans, I had a terrible nightmare. In the dream, I woke up inside of a tent somewhere in the Arctic after a body in a body bag fell out of the sky. I wanted to stay inside of the tent, but I thought, man, a body just fell out of the sky. You might want to check it out. So I unzipped the body bag, and there was a dead guy with light brown hair inside. He had a note inside his shirt pocket. I pulled it out and read it. It was a love letter to my girlfriend. It said, Now you know how much I truly love you. At that point, the corpse opened its eyes and stood up. I was so annoyed that this asshole zombie thing was hitting on my girlfriend by committing suicide that I took him by the shoulders and escorted him out of the Arctic to the parking lot. In the dream, there was a parking lot around the entire Arctic. Okay, it's a dream. They don't always make sense. Just go with it. Anyway, I told him to get out and stay away from me and my girlfriend. Then I followed him to where he lived. The place had lit candles everywhere, and I thought it looked like a shop of some sort. I was still so mad at him that I took a piece of sharp metal and slashed up his face. It was such a gruesome dream that I actually wrote it down when I woke up. The next night I was in the hotel bar and I asked the bartender if there were any ghost stories attached to the hotel, it being New Orleans and all. She told me there was a ghost story, but they weren't supposed to talk about it. She told me anyway. In October of 2006, not long after Hurricane Katrina, a guy named Zach Bowen killed his girlfriend and dismembered her body in an apartment that they shared above a voodoo shop in the French Quarter. Then he came to the Omni Hotel, went up to the rooftop terrace, and jumped to his death. He had a suicide note in his pocket. 
The bartender said that people have reported seeing a shadowy figure leaping from the building ever since. I got on the internet and looked up the story, and I found a picture. And he looked just like the guy in my dream. Here's a photo of him and his girlfriend, Addie Hall. This is what he wrote in the actual suicide note. This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol car to 823 North Rampart, you'll find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend, Addie, in the oven, on the stove, and in the refrigerator, as well as a full signed confession from me. Signed, Zach Bowen. I had been completely unaware of any of this before my dream. I've had my fair share of encounters working nights in various nursing homes. When you have that many people pass away in one place, you're bound to have a few stick around. Three of my favorites are as follows, and to this day, I'm at a loss to explain how any of them happened. Story 1 Late one night, a picture of the Virgin Mary was removed from the wall and thrown 15 feet down the hallway from where it was hanging. It was lying face down on the floor, but totally unbroken. All of the people who worked there were at the nurse's station, so we know none of us did it. Could it have been a resident? I don't know how, because everyone on that floor was bed-bound, and all of them were asleep when we checked. Story number two. I once had two of my CNAs come to me almost in tears because they were so scared and confused. They found one of the residents and all of his bedding on the floor in the middle of the night. Not only was this particular resident bedbound, but he was also unresponsive. Yet the sheet, bed pad, pillow, and all of his covers were on the floor, with him under them, just how we put him to bed earlier, but on the floor. It looked as if someone had just picked him up like a baby, with all of his bedding, and gently laid him down on the floor all tucked in. And story number three. I was doing rounds one night in another facility that was supposed to be haunted. The elevators were down, so we had to check all four floors by using the stairs. Through the years, this building had been used as a civil war hospital, a tuberculosis clinic, and then a psychiatric nursing home. The third and fourth floors were the ones that were supposed to be haunted so of course nobody wanted to go up there alone. But I told the others to put on their big girl panties and we'd all go up together. As I was just starting to climb the steps from the second to the third floor, a pair of unseen hands pushed me, hard. So hard, in fact, that I fell backwards and down a few steps. Needless to say, after that, the others flat out refused to go any further and I finished the rounds alone. These stories don't even begin to cover all of the things I've seen, heard, and experienced in nursing homes through the years. If you don't believe in the paranormal, just go work nights in a nursing home for a month or two. You'll change your mind. In my first apartment, my roommate and I had two bedrooms that were connected in the middle by the bathroom, like on the Brady Bunch. There was a long mirror that ran the length of the wall on one side. The tub and toilet were located on the opposite wall, so you could basically watch yourself as you showered because we had a glass shower door. About a week after we moved in, I was in the shower and the door to my roommate's bedroom opened slightly. She wasn't home but I shrugged it off, thinking maybe the A.C. had blown it open a bit. I bent over to get the shampoo, and upon standing up again, I saw a pale middle-aged man with dark hair and a bushy mustache staring at me in the mirror. I screamed and looked around for anything I could find to use to defend myself. I grabbed the loofah with that long stick on it and opened the shower door, 
ready to fight whoever it was that was standing there. But nobody was there. I grabbed a towel and ran into my room. I checked all of the possible hiding spots, armed with my loofah stick. I checked under the beds, in closets, in the pantry, etc. But I found nothing. The front door and windows were locked, and my roommate wasn't home, so I just put it down to my imagination and moved on. But the next day, I heard my roommate screaming in the bathroom. Guess who showed up for her shower, too? We named the ghost Fred, and we'd catch him spying on us every now and then when we showered. He never tried anything, just watched. Pervert. Thank you so much for listening tonight and for being part of my family of darkness. I've missed you all, and I hope you've missed me as well. And while I still won't be here every week, I will be dropping videos from time to time, so keep an eye on my community page. I'll be announcing the videos there in advance. Now have a nice Halloween, and I'll see you next time.